We launch into our second part of our series on getting ready for the last days and spotting and avoiding manipulation. We're going to look at some different aspects, move in a little bit deeper into the subject of manipulation in particular. But the world is just filled with much information today. You know, Daniel talked about that. In the book of Daniel, God gave Daniel insight and allowed him to look into the future to such a degree and to such a clarity and, and fulfillment that people today, we still look at Daniel's prophecies after thousands of years and we recognize that he was speaking about our day. He said that there would be an increase in, in knowledge and information in the last days. And truly we're living in that day today. It is estimated as far as we can determine that 90% of the world's data was created in the last two years. Let me say that again. 90% of the world's data was created in the last two years. They estimate that one trillion gigabytes of information is available on the internet alone, just on the internet. Now the difficulty with all this information, and it's an overload of information, but the difficulty in the midst of all of this information availability is determining what is accurate and what isn't accurate. What's true and what isn't true. Because honesty and manipulation coexist together. So this makes it sometimes very, very confusing. It's, it's everywhere. It, it has been here since the beginning. Manipulation, deception has been here from the very beginning, since the garden. And the Bible tells us, you say, why would you focus more than one message on manipulation? Well, because the Bible tells us that the closer we get to the end of time, to the end of this dispensation, the more deception, manipulation, intimidation, that family will increase. And so it's important that you and I be ready. It's everywhere. It's literally everywhere around us. Manipulation takes place so often that often we don't spot it. We kind of ignore it or we kind of just, we kind of tune it out or sometimes we just kind of excuse it and say that's the way it is. You know, an example of that would be if you're watching television and you watch some of these commercials of these fast food um, companies, these fast food restaurants, you will see their depiction of what supposedly you get when you go into that restaurant, when you order a certain sandwich or order a certain meal. Sometimes it's even in the bill, on the billboards as we drive down the road, they will have a picture of something that looks fantastic. Well, I guarantee you it's about 10 times better looking and, and on television looks better and about 10 times bigger than what you're going to get when you actually go to purchase that in the restaurant. You know, on, it's just so beautiful and it's steaming and it's just hanging over the bun and makes you salivate. And then you go in and some person behind the counter who really doesn't want to be there hands you a, a paper bag and you open up that thing wrapped in paper and it's all smashed together with a guy back there putting it together, just forced it all together. Doesn't look, and you hold that up and you look at the commercial and you say, this doesn't look anything like it. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the world we live in. And that's called really manipulation. We're going to get you in the door by promising you something that isn't even close to what you're going to get once you get here. It's everywhere. Manipulation is everywhere we look. Deception is everywhere we look. In fact, the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 and 13, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse deceiving and being deceived. Deceiving and being deceived. Now our scripture background for this series is found in 2 Samuel, the 15th chapter. We are connecting with a, an account of one of David's sons called Absalom. And we spoke about this last week, gave you a little bit of background, but the, the synopsis of that story is this that Absalom as one of David's sons, son of the king, certainly a privileged young man, actually turned to where his desire for power and his desire for attention um, and his desire to rule 
drove him to the point where he began to use manipulation. He is a perfect story, a perfect picture of what manipulation can look like. And our verse for the background and the basis of this series is found in 2 Samuel 15 verses 5 and 6 because it actually describes, it cuts right to the core, it describes what was going on in the heart of Absalom. And remember, this was manipulation to dethrone his own father. But it says also whenever anyone approached him, that is Absalom, to bow down before him because he was the king's son, Absalom would reach out his hand, take hold of him, and kiss him. Now that would have been a shock to the individual in that day. That would have been an activity of graciousness such as hardly has ever been seen. Absalom behaved in this way towards all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice. And listen to the words, and so he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. And so in this manner, through this manipulative process, he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. When he sat by the gate, he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. So we're going to do a quick review, and we need to move very quickly. If you weren't here last week, I would remind you that this, these messages are now available on social media, and you're able to find them. If you have difficulty finding them, please check with uh, the office, call into the office, and they can help steer you to where you can find these and listen to last week's message to bring you up to speed. But what is manipulation? Manipulation, as I just said, comes from a very bad family. It's got some very bad relatives, relatives that you and I would recognize, relatives that work hand in hand, relatives whose operations are so akin to manipulation that often there is a flow from the activity of one of the relatives of manipulation to manipulation and back and forth. Manipulation often uses deception. Deception is the act of misleading or cause someone, causing someone to accept as true what is actually false and invalid. It is a misrepresentation of the facts. It is a, it is a scheming, it is a turning of the facts. In fact, the Bible tells us that Satan is the ultimate deceiver. In Ephesians 6, 11, Speaking to God's people, Paul reminds the people in the church of Ephesus to be careful. He says, put on the whole armor of God, everything that he had just told them about, so you can stand against, and the King James Version says wiles. Well, we don't use that word anymore, and 90% of the people wouldn't be able to tell, tell me what wiles actually means. Well, when you go back into the original language, it, it means the deceit or the schemes or the evil tricks of the devil, which is a description of deception. Now, another relative of manipulation we talked about last week was intimidation. Intimidation is also closely related to manipulation. Intimidation is the action of frightening or threatening someone or something, usually in order to persuade them to do something you want them to do. We call that today, there is, a, there is a phrase called bullying, intimidation, bullying. And whether that be by forcing a Christian, we see the government can intimidate, the government can manipulate, entities can do that, powerful entities, companies, any group of powerful people, any organization can participate in these things that we have just defined and certainly can participate and do participate in intimidation. Governments have, have operated in that down through the centuries, and we see even yet today. We see it in operation in our own nation, where there is a threat of intimidation, threats to Christians in particular, or individuals, or forcing a Christian company to violate their personal faith or belief. If they don't violate it, then thus and so will happen to you, or even determining where we can pray where you can pray, when you can pray, how you can pray. And if you, do, if you step outside of that line, there is a power and a force of intimidation through power that will come against you. We see that even just in our headlines in Nashville this past week. 
Six pro-life activists were convicted in federal court of conspiracy to violate the, quote, Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Act. You say you've never heard of that. Well, that, you've not heard of that because that is something that was just created by this administration after the action of the Supreme Court to reverse Roe versus Wade. And so it is a relatively new category in which you can threaten and intimidate individuals into doing what you want them to do. And these people have been, have been convicted in federal court this past week because they peacefully prayed and sang at the entrance of an abortion clinic in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. One of these individuals is Ms. Edel, who was, she's 88 years old, and she can recall being taken off in a cattle car as a little child in World War II, and she's a survivor of the Holocaust, a survivor of concentration camps, and the reason she prays, she said, and sings and stands outside of clinics is that she wishes someone would have stood on the tracks and tried to stop the trains that hauled her and her family to the concentration camps. But in the United States of America now, if you pray and sing outside of an abortion clinic, you now face a possible prison sentence of 10 years, 10 and a half years, and $250,000 fine. And yet at the same time, there is tremendous unconcern on the part of our current administration regarding investigating dozens upon dozens of violent, not peaceful attacks against pro-life pregnancy centers in 2020. For some reason, there is only a blank stare when that is brought up. Ladies and gentlemen in church, I'm telling you that it is time for us to wake up and recognize that the epicenter of the target in these days is becoming more and more the center of those individuals who dare to believe that the Bible is true, who place their faith in Jesus Christ, and who dare to live that life out in public. The troubling thing, the more, the more troubling thing to me, I must be honest with you, is that that when that news reaches most Christians in the United States and most churches, and many times it doesn't ever reach the church, the church in America is ambivalent. We are, we are almost ambivalent to it. And we meet the news with shrugged shoulders as we complacently sip our lattes in the church foyer. And we may look at one another and say, isn't that too bad? But that's about all the action, that's about all the ire that this type of news draws from current Christians in the United States. And I tell you of a truth, unless we listen to what's going on around us and then compare that to what the scripture says and recognize that we have a responsibility as the people of God to stand against evil and to speak up for the right, we will find ourselves soon in a condition and in a place where as was written during World War II, first they came after them, then they came after them, and now they came after us, and there was no one to stand for us. We are living in a day of deception and intimidation, and it will only increase as we go forward. I've told you many times that they are not going to stop unless we stop them. And unless the church arises to the place where we come to a point where we have more desire to see God's kingdom live in our current world and be passed on to our children and grandchildren than we do, we are, going to, we are going to lose this war. But our subject today is manipulation. Manipulation means to manage or utilize skillfully. It is the skillful handling, controlling, or using of something or someone. Actually, manipulation is a fairly, fairly new word. Manipulation, of course, can be used to describe someone who's manipulating the clay to create a beautiful sculpture. It is also used to describe an entity or an organization or an individual that is skillfully manipulating someone else to create what they desire. That is a definition of manipulation. And again, as we've said, powerful entities, institutions, the media, governments, 
can and you do use manipulation to control people. Science has recently become a manipulative tool in the hands of very powerful people. Teaching us now and teaching our children that gender is fluid now. It is not determined by God. It is not determined by X and Y chromosomes, even so much as they declare with a straight face that a man can have a baby. Science has become a source of propaganda and a source of manipulation of the masses and if we are not careful of ourselves. The media has become a, a powerful tool of deception and manipulation and intimidation. Did you know there's a journalist creed? In 1914, there was authored a journalist creed and it defined journalism as an independent profession that respects God and honors mankind. Journalists were told that they must exercise, and I'm quoting, self-control, patience, fearlessness, and respect for their readers. Around the 1960s, this all began to change. And advocacy replaced objectivity, liberalism and progressivism replaced impartiality. And in fact, today it is just a known fact, a, it even indicated through extensive research, Jim Kuypers in his research concluded that today's mainstream media and growing numbers of local media as well as local media and media outlets are swallowed up by larger outlets who are, who are run, and, run and controlled by liberals. That is now seeping into the local area as well and that they are both liberal and progressive in their personal lives and reporting is what was discovered by Jim Kuypers in his extensive research of media. In fact, he said one well-known major newspaper editor told him this, we're not very subtle. If you work here, you must be one of us. You must be liberal and you must be a progressive or you won't even be hired. So we're living in a day, and, and yet, yet in spite of that, let me back up a moment, in spite of that, there is still a lingering trust of the media from days gone by. Some of you remember Walter Cronkite and Huntley and Brinkley, good night, good night. I remember those days, black and white television, a TV that didn't have a remote. I was the remote, and Dad had control over me. But those were days in which you could trust the media and that lingering trust is something the media knows still exists and they're utilizing that to manipulate the masses into the agenda, into the direction of the agenda that they hold. I could go on, our schools and higher ed institutions have become hotbeds of manipulation of the students they are entrusted with as teachers and professors indoctrinate kids with lies. This decade, This decades-long effort has successfully created a couple of generations ignorant of truth regarding the, even the founding of our nation, our founding principles. They know more about other nations than they do the nation they live in. They know more about socialism than they do a democratic republic. And they have even been, been manipulated in regards to issues of morality where there is shocking evidence that we are, be, we are awakening to the shocking evidence and demonstration of where higher ed and our education has actually led our young people. A report that I read just this past week said that 51%, according to a recent poll, of Americans 18 to 24 year, years old think that what Hamas did to the Jewish victims was justifiable. Ladies and gentlemen, that means that 51% of the young people and those in their 20s in the United States believe that it was all right and justifiable to gouge out eyes, to rape women, to impale children, to cut the heads off of individuals and parade them through the streets while the throngs cheered and clapped and tried to reach out and touch the heads so that they could just be a part of it. 51%. This, 
This is all indicative. If this, you say, why would you tell? Because part of my responsibility is to awaken us and to awaken you and to prepare us and to get us to recognize that we are in a situation that is going to require all of our effort, all of our input, not just a few, not just individuals that stand with a microphone pinned to their chest and have some type of a platform, but that all of us as Christians are called to take our stand and to lift our voice and to take action to stop that which is incredibly evil. If we don't, they will not stop. <laughs> I could stay there, but I'm not going to. But let's talk about manipulation. It's not limited to entities. It's not limited to such evil as we have just described. Manipulation is not just utilized by powerful governments or powerful entities. But the manipulation that most you and I will mostly encounter is manipulation that is affected upon us and put upon us by individuals. Many times individuals that we trust, individuals that are friends, individual acquaintances. And manipulation uses a variety of tools, it uses anger in an effort to frighten the individual. It uses victimhood. Manipulators are often very intelligent, very intelligent individuals or very selfish and or both individuals. It'll use victimhood. You'll see, you'll see children use this. You know, we, we are born with this ability to try to get our own way, and you'll see children that all of a sudden will begin to cry, and those crocodile tears will begin to roll down their cheeks, and they'll begin to tell you that you just hate them, and, you don't, and really what they're doing is they're manipulating you to get what they want, that you just told them no. But adults can do that. Never outgrow that and begin to skillfully manipulate others. They'll gaslight you. They'll use negative criticism or questions to cause a person to question themselves. That's, those are all tools by manipulation, of manipulation. Favors is one of the most common. It's, what, it's actually what Absalom used, was favors and compliments and flattery used to win your heart, used to draw you to themselves, all in an effort to get you to do what they want you to do. So what is the end result of manipulation? The practice of manipulation, as I said, takes place in every arena, every area, anywhere there, is, there are human beings, and it has taken place all the way down through history, as I said, since the garden. If you are being manipulated, what are the end results? And if you are a manipulator, what is the end result of this thing, manipulation? Why is it such a big deal? Why, why would the Bible talk about it? What's it have to do with my daily living in 2024 in Salem, Ohio, or in this region? Why, why is it such a big deal? Well, first of all, if you are being manipulated, you lose your, your autonomy. Manipulation confines its victims to predetermined ends. You lose your freedom and opportunity to make your own choices and to choose your own direction. An individual who's being manipulated and an individual who manipulates may not constrict you to the point where you feel smothered, but they may skillfully constrict you to the place where, they, where you operate within the confines of their own desires. In other words, almost like a fenced-in backyard, you have an opportunity and you may even feel a resemblance of freedom and liberty. You may think, I'm not being manipulated, I'm free. And the only way you find out you're being manipulated is when you seek to go beyond the confines of the manipulator. When you disagree with what the manipulator, their opinion or what they've told you to believe. When you begin to try to go outside the fence, then you will begin to recognize the manipulator will begin to object and they will skillfully begin to inflict upon you various methods of manipulation to get you back in with, within the region of control. So really manipulation, and if you're a victim of manipulation, if I'm a victim of manipulation, I lose my freedom. I lose my true opportunity to make my own choices. 
to choose my own direction. Now we're not talking about those matters of law that are put there to protect us and give us liberty. Liberty is not license. And there are certain restraints that the law has established so that it protects liberty. But rather we're talking about the predetermined confines of an individual who is working to manipulate you. And you lose, more importantly, the opportunity to choose what God has for you. If you're being manipulated, both your own will and God's will is displaced. Because I, actually I've seen people in the church, good people who love God, skillfully manipulated by other people, even in the church or within the body of faith at large, whether that be a, a family member or a fellow Christian. And as a result, I've seen good godly people moved out of God's plan for their life. And what happens is they begin to listen to the person more than they listen to God. They begin to listen to what the person wants, what the person is telling them you need to do, what the person has told them, even using phrases like, God told me this is what you need to do, or God showed me a vision about you. Please recognize that manipulators are not adverse to using religious terminology and religious manipulative phrases because they know you love God to manipulate you into the, into the activity or into the position or into the action that they want you to take. Or maybe if, even into a place to draw you to follow them. They're looking for a following. And by handy, that's what Absalom was doing. Absalom was seeking to gather a following around himself and turn the people away from his father, King David. And so he, he lavished favors and compliments on the people. That is all part of manipulation. The Bible says in 2 Samuel 15, 13, that here was the summary. A messenger came to David and he told David this, the hearts of the men of Israel are now with Absalom. He has successfully turned the tide through the power of manipulation. Now, let me say this to you, if you are a manipulator, and sometimes <clears throat> it is easy to fall in to the trap and into the pattern of manipulation. Because you may believe that your way is the right way. That really you are right. In fact, you're right most of the time. And so you just need to bring other people along and rather than inform individuals, you begin to pressure them, whether by intimidation or manipulation, to follow what you believe is correct. Very easy to fall into that. And sometimes manipulators are even blind to themselves. They have deceived themselves. And others can see it, but they can't see it. But if you are a manipulator, let me tell you this, that one of the, one of the tremendous negative aspects and results of manipulation is that you will only achieve what your own hand can accomplish. You will only achieve in your life what your own power, your own strength, your own hand can accomplish. You eliminate what God would and could do in your life and through you because you have taken the reins. You are calling the shots. You're the one acting as God seeking to manipulate people. You cancel the destiny of God for your life and you will never see your life purpose fulfilled if you follow the way of manipulation. If you're a manipulator, you live within the confines of your own small and limited abilities. You in the world, maybe others looking on, may think that you've accomplished great things with your life. But I can tell you that according to what I read within the word, compared to God's plan, what he wanted to do in you, what he wanted to do through you, what will be revealed on the last day when we stand before him and all things are made known to us regarding our own life, you will find that you fell way short of God's will for your life and is very puny compared to what God wanted to do in you and through you and the lasting effect that he wanted to use your life for. The end of Absalom was tragic. 
We go back to the story of Absalom. It was tragic. He was killed as a very young man. He was impaled by spears of David's own soldiers. And his body was thrown in a pit. But there is a very sad verse about Absalom. And it, and it reveals that he was limited because he was doing everything within his own power. He had really no one in his life who wanted to honor him. He was seeking honor, but he saw and recognized that no one wanted to honor him. And that is found in 2 Samuel 18, 18. It says, Absalom in his lifetime had taken and set up a pillar for himself, which is in the king's valley. Listen to that. He set up a pillar for himself. Why? Because he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. And he called the pillar after his own name. And to this day, it is called Absalom's monument. There was no one who wanted to honor him. And so everything was done within his own power. Even, even drawing attention to his own name. He recognized that after he died, no one would remember him unless he himself did something so that he would be remembered. When you are a manipulator, if I am guilty of manipulation, I am limiting, constraining, I am stopping what God wants to do in my life because I've taken it into my own hands. So how does God feel about manipulation? Manipulation is serious business and contrary to the ways and will of God. The Bible is very clear about this. He throws manipulation in with the category of deception. As I said, they're very closely related to one another. Galatians, the fifth chapter, verses 19 through 21, as we read last week, it says that manipulation is like witchcraft. And in fact, in one of the translations, Galatians 5.20 says this, chasing after things instead of God, manipulating others, hatred of those who get in the way, senseless arguments, resentment when others are favored, temper tantrums, angry quarrels, only thinking of yourself, being, loved with your own, being in love with your own opinions. God classifies manipulation with witchcraft. Now, witchcraft is the illicit use of spiritual power in replacement of God for a desired end. Witchcraft is using demonic power rather than the Spirit of God. Manipulation is using fleshly ability and power to also get your own way and attain your own ends. And manipulation, according to God, is something that he, he hates. He hates manipulation. Why does he hate it? I read an article about Janine Reich, and I want to thank her for this because she helped me put it into words. First of all, God hates manipulation because it is motivated by either fear or selfishness or both. Many times people who manipulate are fearful people. And fear is contrary to the will of God. And selfishness is contrary to the nature of God. And those who try to control others do so because they are afraid of what might happen if the person is able to make their own choice. They are afraid of what might happen if they actually allow you to choose if you are being manipulated. Manipulators are selfish. The bottom line is this, manipulation and deception is considered evil because it, it is for selfish ends. It is to cause you or to work to get someone or some group of people to do what man wants done rather than seeking the will of God. Manipulators are selfish, and they try to control others because they want things their way, even if they have to step on your rights. Because really, your rights aren't that important, they know better. And that you, you have to really, if you're, if you're really listening, and, and manipulators will, here's another thing about manipulators that aren't in your notes, they are dogged. They are dogged. What do I mean by that? I mean, they do not give up. If you happen to rise up, and next week we're going to talk about what are the actions we take when we recognize we're being manipulated, or if we're a manipulator. There are practical aspects, there's practical steps we can take. But if you begin to rise up and slightly disagree with a manipulator, or even indicate it, they will push back. There will be some type of response. Either they'll drop their lip and begin to act like you're really hurting their feelings because you're disagreeing with them. That's manipulation, by the way. 
or they will begin to argue with you in a manner that they, will, they just recognize, they're telling you, you really don't get it. Let me put it another way. That's manipulation, and God hates it because it's motivated by fear or selfishness or both. Second reason God hates manipulation is because it involves some form of deception and trickery. We've talked about that all the way through the message. Manipulation often uses deception. And those that practice manipulation, the Bible says, will have their place in the lake of fire. Revelation 21.8. And it talks about the devil is the father of lies and he's the number one manipulator. So when I manipulate, I am going in league, I'm acting just like the devil. And in case you didn't know it, God and the devil are really not on the same side. And so I make myself an enemy of God. Now let me tell you that persuasion is different than manipulation. We can seek to persuade someone for an honorable reason. We're not seeking to take away their power of choice, but we are persuading them. In fact, Paul said that he persuaded men. He said, knowing the terror of God, knowing what lies in the future, Paul said, I do my best to persuade men to turn to Christ. Persuasion is different than manipulation. Again, manipulation is seeking to take away your free will through trickery or schemes, cleverly designed approaches, take away your freedom and your choice for a selfish reason and a selfish end. Finally, God hates, and perhaps the, the greatest reason, the main reason God hates manipulation is because it tries to control, as I've said many times, the choices and decisions and actions of another person. Why would God hate that? Because God, God, manipulation is based on the premise that not everyone should have the ability to make their own choice. And God doesn't believe that. God, does, God never created you and I to be manipulated by, or controlled by others. He has given you and I a free will. And remember, the reason this is so important is we are in a day of, of probably unequal deception and manipulation. We are moving into a period and a time when the Bible says if God does not shorten the days, even the very elect may be deceived. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to take note when God says that he's going to have to shorten the days talking about the coming of the Antichrist, talking about the deception that will deceive the whole world. And God says, I'm going to have to shorten the days lest the very elect and lest those who are walking with me the closest might be deceived. That is a warning to you and I that if we think we can't be deceived, you're already deceived. That we need to stay alert and awake. And the Bible says that God hates manipulation because it takes away your freedom. And God is the originator, the author, the creator of liberty and freedom. Contrary to what those who hate religion and hate Christianity would tell you, and perhaps, perhaps we haven't presented it in a manner that's been fitting, Christianity and the intention of God and the intention of Jesus Christ is never to take away your freedom or liberty. It is truly to set you free because the freedom and liberty as defined by this world is truly not freedom and liberty. You are being deceived. It is bondage and it is slavery. God's design is so that you and I may be free. That's why it says, if the Son, if Jesus makes you free, you are free indeed. You are truly free. Now, as we close this, I want you to know, and for those of you that keep track of how long I preach after I say those words, I'm going to close. After we close this, as we close this, let us recognize that this could be a very discouraging message. It's not intended to be discouraging. God never intends to discourage us by sharing with us the facts or the truth 
about what is going on because God has created you and I for this day, for such a time as this. You're here on purpose. The Lord knew you were coming. He knows who you are. And God has called us to this time to be overcomers. You and I have not been placed into a time period, into a period of history where God will look at us someday in the future and say, I'm sorry, I, I ran out of power. I ran out of ability. I ran out of grace. I ran out of everything that was in the Bible. I just kind of ran short. The Bible tells us that God has called us to a life of liberty and freedom regardless of what may be happening. And really, it's because of the desire for freedom and liberty. That is deep within the human soul. You and I long to be free. God created us with that desire. It is this desire, this principle of liberty and freedom that impelled a, a, and united really a group of diverse colonists from the, from the various colonies to take action and to stand against the greatest military power in the world. In our battle for independence, it was about liberty. It was about freedom. It was this desire and even God's proclamation of freedom that impelled our forefathers to, to put it everywhere, even to cast it into their bells that they hung in public buildings. The Liberty Bell in Philadelphia. The, our forefathers put scripture of freedom and liberty into it. That says, proclaim liberty throughout the land to all of its inhabitants. That is a direct quotation from Leviticus 25.10. Ladies and gentlemen, God has not called us to bondage. He hasn't called us to deception. He has not called us to manipulation. It is not his desire for you. It is not his desire for his people, for his church, for those who follow him. It, freedom is God's desire. And the freedom that God desires for nations and for us can only be found in a greater source than human strength. In fact, Alex de Tocqueville, when he wrote the book, Democracy, and he came to the United States in the early 1800s to view what was going on here. He said this, liberty cannot be established without morality, nor morality without faith. And so we recognize that this liberty that I talk about, this ability to stand against manipulation and recognize it, does not come from an innate ability within us, but actually it is a gift from God. A person may live in a free country, quote unquote, and yet truly not be free. True freedom originates from God. True freedom originates from Christ. And true freedom is placed within the heart. When you truly come to Christ, there are those who have a faith or a belief that will not stand the test. But when you truly come to Christ and you seek His freedom, he brings that freedom into the seat of freedom, and that is your heart. And freedom in the heart can never, can never be taken away by human power. When God sets you free, when God sets you free, when God sets a person free in their heart, mankind and every devil in creation may do their best to wring that freedom out of their heart. But if they will keep their little hand in God's and follow God and simply listen to God, they cannot touch that freedom. History records it down through the ages. We have thousands upon thousands of testimonies of individuals who have been placed into bondage and tortured because of Christ in the cause of freedom, and they have testified triumphantly that even though they were brought under great pressure, the powers were not able to touch the freedom that Christ had placed in their heart. Freedom always wins. Freedom always wins. The devil, when he has done his best, the Bible records this Bible records that there is coming a day when the devil and the deceiver, the one who has deceived the nations, that God will order an angel. Think about that. God has such power that the entity that has deceived the world for millennia, the devil, Satan, 
God will send an angel. God won't even get up off of his throne. Jesus will not rise from his seat. He'll just, he'll just look at an angel and say, go get him. And the Bible says that an angel will chain the devil. And the devil who sought to rob the freedom and did successfully rob freedom and put in bondage millions of humans will then himself find himself chained by the power of God and placed where God has decreed he belongs. You and I win in the end. Liberty wins. Freedom wins. The freedom that Christ gives wins. And as we leave this place, be not afraid of manipulation. Be not afraid of intimidation. Stand up for that which God has told you to do. Be not afraid of deception. Be on guard, but recognize God has equipped us to stand in this day. And if you are free by Christ, you are free in your heart. So let us go not discouraged. I've read the end of the book. We win. Amen. Ain't nobody going to vote it in and nobody going to vote it out. It's already done. I don't know about you, but I'm going to keep my hand in the hand of the Lord and ask him to help me and guide and direct me. Next week, we'll conclude this series. We'll talk about what we do, what practical steps there are to victory. And you and I, as the body of Christ, as believers in Christ, how we can be prepared for what is coming and what we see on the horizon. But let us not be afraid. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Let's pray. Father, we pray right now for individuals gathered in this place. This has been more of a message of information than inspiration, but we believe the information is vital, the truth is vital to strengthening your people and preparing them, preparing us for these last days. I pray for that person who is fearful and timid, I pray, O oh God, that you will help them to surrender to you and recognize as they read your word and as they sense your still small voice that you have not destined them for defeat but for victory. I pray, O oh God, for those that are being lied to and those that are being manipulated. I pray, O oh God, that encouragement will rise in their heart and with the revelation they'll recognize that there is a solution and it is found in you. You have decreed that we be free. May your power move. And for that individual that doesn't know you, they know about you. They may even know the scriptures. They may have been catechized, dedicated, consecrated, but they really don't know you. And they need to allow you to come in to the throne room of their heart. I pray that right now they will open the door to that knock and they will invite you in and ask you to forgive them of every sin which you graciously do. That's what you're waiting to do and to throw those sins into the sea of forgetfulness and put them in a place where it is as if they have never sinned and they have a new life in Christ and they begin an adventure with you. I pray that will happen right now in their heart by the power of the blood of Jesus and the cross. We thank you for victory, nothing but victory. We claim victory and we walk in victory and we leave in victory in Jesus' name, amen.